Okay, so if nobody objects, we can first introduce ourselves and then I can go ahead and do the questions and we can each answer the question. That sound good for everybody? Okay, so to start off, my name is Diana Castellara. I am a student at the University of Central Missouri and I am a double major in social work and secondary education with a minor in juvenile justice. Okay, I'll go next. Um, I'm Victoria and um, I use she, her, her pronouns and I am a sophomore at the University of Kansas and I'm studying secondary education history and I'm also minoring in Italian and women, gender, sexuality studies and I hope to one day become a district superintendent. Hi, my name is Justin Ramirez Reis, he, her, he, her, he, him. I'm a student at Sumner Academy, and yeah, that's about it. So to start off today, we would like to thank everybody that has joined us today and for all your support. So what do you think draws students to major in education today? Um, I can start. Um, I would say that um, it's teachers who are currently teaching who are inspiring students right now, who are inspiring students to become teachers. At least that's how it was for me. Um, I decided to become a teacher because I was inspired by the many teachers that I had in high school. Um, and so it just really takes at least just one inspiring teacher to inspire many others to get into the education field. It's um, it's something inspiring and it's, it's not something you want to do because it's a high paying job or or other things that there's many issues in the education system um, like lack of support for teachers from the admin and things like that so really wanting to get into it um, this profession nowadays it's because you get inspired by by wanting to inspire others but by wanting to inspire young people so yeah I had to agree with that like yeah, I, I just remember having one particular teacher that I was really enjoying their job and it was very inspiring to me. Just kind of the same of what she said. For me personally, I actually had somewhat of a different experience. Growing up, I had very little teachers. Most of them were did not look like me. So I was not able to connect with them. When asking questions about understanding a word better, they would just, well, it's so simple, but it wasn't so simple to me. When asking questions about things such as fast food, they had somewhat of a knowledge, but they didn't have the same situation I did. So it was me, me being drawn into education is me wanting to become more connected to students like me, just because I didn't have somebody that I could connect to. They were very different backgrounds, so I want to be able to teach somebody with a similar background and tell them that it's okay to ask questions and I'm not going to just say, well, it's simple to me. So being able to support other students. What are some of the biggest challenge changes you have noticed or experienced from your first years as a student to your older years as a student? What are your thoughts on these changes? Um, personally, some of the big, biggest changes I noticed um, is that um, I learned English really fast. And throughout the year, throughout my school years, um, I noticed that a lot of our, a lot, um, some of my teachers are starting to uh, speak Spanish with me, and they're trying to be trying to use both languages in their classes, specifically language classes. But obviously, they have to do that. But this is my first time experiencing something like that. Um, I know a lot of people that that are like me and, and identify uh, similar to me that had a hard time going into school because they didn't understand English. But at an early age, I was exposed, I, at a really, really young age, I was exposed to English. And because of that, I, I didn't struggle with English, but I lost a lot of my Spanish because English was everywhere, like around me. And the only English I got, the only Spanish I got were from my parents. Um, but then in school, like everything I did for fun, video games, uh, extracurricular, everything I do was, the, was spoken in English. And that's why I ended up losing a lot of my Spanish. But once I started talking with you know these teachers that are teaching language classes 
and introducing me to new things like the Latinx. I'm realizing that I want to speak Spanish more because it's part of my culture and I do enjoy and love my culture. Um, for me, um, the biggest changes I've noticed in like the education system is that like nowadays, um, uh, teachers are starting to teach more like student centered um, in their lessons, meaning like they care more about the students like needs and their um, like their backgrounds and like centering the education around them and like I feel like now we've like we've progressed more um, in society and in the education system because now we're like noticing that like we're realizing that the education is for the students and it's so it should obviously be tailored to their student to the students needs and their interests um and so yeah that's what i've noticed that like it's more about the student now and less like you know about the teacher um and less of like just being like a facilitator as a teacher you know teachers are like engaging students more and um and like considering their needs and things like that so yeah I think personally a lot, it really depends on the environment that you're in. I was in a prominently Caucasian neighborhood growing up, so I did not see a lot of diversity. Then coming into the Wyandotte district and the Kansas City district to Central Middle School, which is a lot of Hispanics, it was a relief to see people that look like me, a relief to see teachers that actually cared about my culture and weren't disrespectful. Then transitioning to Sumner Academy, that same respect was continued. There was a lot of respect to not just my culture, but other cultures as well. There never seemed to be an incident about somebody saying something disrespectful about any culture. And if so, somebody would educate them and they would understand. They would go back and realize what they did. Now going to University of Central Missouri, it's a lot different. This is a prominently Caucasian school again. And it's starting that process all over again. So it's really the environment that you're in. And that's why I want to be an educator so I can educate students, even at the college level, to understand that cultural appropriation is true and it should be stopped. Okay. What do you think that the future of being an educator looks like? How do you think schools, teachers need to adapt in order to meet the needs of modern students and learners? I think uh, I think it uh, for I think for schools on the schools part I think we need to lean away from the culture of how we treat our students and how we teach them because our culture is uh, very old. It was our schools were made in industrial age and they haven't really changed. This idea of like sitting students down, lecturing and giving giving directions and having them following them. And then having them move to classes by bells is the same thing in indus industries and factories would do to, to their workers. And that's how they would treat them. And I think schools need to break away from that and give students, you know, more, make them more, in, make them interact more with their learning and be more purposeful instead of like making them just sit and hear a lecture and do the work. Um, and on the teacher side, I think we should, shouldn't should rely too heavily on a lecturing style of teaching. There's other forms of teaching we could do for our students, like project-based learning, where we make a student do a project, like, hey, um, go try to figure out, like, the, the faces of the moon. And through that through that uh, project, they learn, like, new things. I think that's some things the schools should do and the teachers should do as well. Um, I think that... Um, that teachers should have like a more like um, they need to like have more like cultural sensitivity and like more like knowledge about like how to like um, you know like talk to people of other cultures um, because nowadays like the student population is becoming more and more diverse and so I feel like teachers need to adapt to that and like um, perhaps even like try to like learn like new languages as well um because again like students are becoming more diverse um 
in the U.S. And, um, and so, yeah, I feel like they also need to be more open-minded as well, um, because, um, students, like, they all have different, like, needs, and, like, they're, they all have unique identities, and so teachers need to, like, like, adapt to that as well, and, like, be more open-minded, um, and also, I also think that teachers need to, like, Uh, probably nowadays like with covid like probably since we're using like more like technology nowadays they also need to like um, adapt to that which can be difficult for a lot of people sometimes but um i think that would be a good thing as well um because right now like we're still in the pandemic and there's a lot of changes going on in the education system that they need to adapt to and that like i feel like what's going on now with the pandemic it's going to affect us in the future as well and like it'll be like something that that we're learning about and like these skills that we're gaining in this pandemic we're going to use them in the future as well in the education system so yeah uh going back to what justin said i think that we in our school system we use a lot of a schedule, a very strict schedule. So there's a lot of lectures. There's a lot of, once the bell rings, you go to your next class. Once the test is over, it seems like that information is zapped out of your head and next to the next subject. Um, through my high school experience, it was almost as if we were little robots. We had to make sure we had the best accomplishments, the best grades. And so I think that right now the school system is very much making little robots instead of making individuals. Although there was some glimpses of them trying to help us find who we are. It felt like it was just information after information. And now going to college, that information is not as necessary. So probably the teachers like understanding that some of the information, although it's part of the curriculum, to, it's not as important to our generation just because we might not use it. And to the following on to the next question, what training do you think future teachers need to be taught in schools that would better benefit students of today? I think I think there are like two main things teachers should be taught. Um, I think the first one I want to mention is like specific teaching techniques. Because I noticed there's like a lot of small niche things like teachers do that um, have negative impacts and they don't know it. And because it, it's so small and tiny, they think it's unimpactful, but it really is. Like, for example, like when, student, when a student messes up the wrong answer consistently. Um, so I know some teachers, they would like belittle the students like, you should already know this. Like, we've already went through this. And I, I remember hating that as a kid. Like, I hated when teachers do that. I felt bad. Like I, I felt bad, and that's the thing I did not want to feel in the middle of class when we we're trying to learn things. Um, so little niche things like that would be important, I think, in my opinion. I think another thing that would be important to teach these teachers is that um, content is important, but also soft skills like confidence, time management, the professional skills. I think those are really important for students, and it's something they need in order to be successful in school. And so I think teachers also need to put an emphasis on that and give give students um, the opportunity to learn those and to practice it. Although even if they might not be successful, they're, we're still kids. It's so important to uh, attempt to teach some of those skills. Um, I think that nowadays teachers um, would benefit from like like learning how to like also like be motivational and inspirational to their students because I feel like it's not just about you know be, um, getting in front of a classroom and teaching and like I mean yeah obviously teaching but like not just like um, you know being a facilitator it's more than that um, because what students are doing in their classrooms nowadays doesn't matter what grade they're in that's going to affect them in the future in their careers as they grow older you know what they're doing in school nowadays that's going to affect them later on so it's something serious that i feel like people don't really think of it that way but um but what teachers are doing currently like it's gonna it influences students um it could be in a positive way and sometimes it could be in a negative way um 
And so I feel like that that's also what teachers um, could benefit from learning. And also, like, um, with, like, students having different backgrounds and uh, different cultures and things like that, like, I think it's also important um, to, like, um, you know, rule out any, like, ignorance among teachers, you know? There's a lot of teachers who are ignorant and um, towards certain cultural, like, customs and um, just cultural things. Um, and so I feel like it would be great for teachers to have some sort of training for that as well and also, like, um, like how to be an anti-racist and things like that, how to, like, support students, you know, um, like, and through activism as well. Um, so, yeah. I think that when it comes to the school systems and what we should be teaching, all of us are going to be hopefully future educators or board members or superintendents. And so we're all, we've all gone through the school system ourselves. We have that experience of having teachers that are not like us. So the training that we have received through us being a student is going to be very important when we're teachers because we know how it feels like to be different. And so I think that's the best training that we could receive, that experience of feeling kind of left out because unfortunately that's what we felt, that that feeling of not having somebody and us wanting to be somebody that our students could trust. So I really think that hands-on training to teachers is important, not just in a community that looks like their community, but somewhere, maybe if they're from the country, go into the city and see how the students get to school and what do they have to struggle through? What if the teenagers have to work after school, they have to do sports, see what their students are really like, not just the ones that they hope to teach, the students overall, because then they might fall in love with the city kids and they might wanna become a teacher in the city. And so it's really that hands-on training that they're provided sometimes, but being able to go out and not just nearby, go out and find a different community, a different culture that they might teach, and really being able to be in the community that they aren't usually part of. And so now our last question that we have scheduled, we will also answer all questions at the end. Um, how do you think that the educator world could recruit more young people to be teachers or want to be teachers? I think, I think it's mainly the teachers because that's how, that's how I want to be an educator, the teacher. The teacher, is, um, the teacher that I looked up to, so, you know, when he taught, it was obvious he loved doing it. It was obvious that he cared for his students as well through his actions and through the unsubtle ways he does it, like through grading. He never gives a student an F unless they truly do not try at all. Um, so I think teachers are a big impact on students. And of course, the teachers that love doing it. Be a teacher because you love to do it and not because it's something that you want. Just something that pays well or something you think is just fun. You're impacting an entire generation. And it's super important that the teachers that we have now will enjoy what they're doing. Because if you really enjoy what you're doing, your students will see that and feel that. And that's what I saw and what I felt. I saw a teacher enjoy it and love doing what he did. And that influenced, influenced me to become a teacher. And I want to be a teacher now because I, I want to impact the generation the way he did to me. I think that's uh, a way the education world could recruit more young people. By having teachers that truly enjoy what they're doing and truly have the good intent in their heart to and positively impact their students. Um, yeah, I agree with that as well. Um, I used to have a teacher in high school who only viewed education as... Um, Showing you the Spanish language palm cards here. I had a teacher in high school who only viewed education as like, just, or like being a teacher as just a job, like they didn't see it as anything else is just a job but I think that's wrong because what teachers are doing they're inspiring students at least that's what they should be doing if um, if they really care about it like not only should they be passionate about the topic they should be passionate about um, the students and like 
their ambitions and their goals and helping them reach their goals and so if and especially we should have more like diverse teachers as well um, because if a student of color is um, doesn't see like someone up there you know in a position of power who looks like them then they're not going to want to be in that profession <coughs> and so and so yeah I feel like we also need more teachers of color um, and like also like the education system could recruit more teachers through um, you know supporting also minority communities because um, if more minorities are supported and like in the education system then that's gonna like inspire and like um inspire others to like want to join that profession because why would you want to you know join a profession if like nobody from that looks like you is in there or nobody that is a minority or who is like you is like supported in that um profession um and so yeah and i feel like we the education system you know has many issues um like I feel like teachers deserve more, especially nowadays with COVID, you know, the amount of work that teachers are doing, um, you know, risking their lives as well with COVID and also having to teach, you know, they deserve a higher pay, they deserve to be paid more. Um, and so I feel like the pay also like um, draws away, draws attention away from, stu from, from people wanting to be teachers. But I feel like, you know, the big part of it is you want to be a teacher because you're inspired and you're passionate about it and you want to change people's lives um and so yeah and yeah that's basically it i think that a way that we could encourage more people going into the education is actually having educators support future educators I remember this one teacher saying, don't go into education, don't do it. It was the worst mistake of my life. And I had seen that teacher through my middle school years. My sister saw that middle school teacher. My brother now has that middle school teacher. So he's impacted quite a few students. And so him saying not to be an educator when he himself is an educator, it's just doesn't, why are you an educator if you're not, if you don't love what you're doing? He says that the pay isn't good, that he has to have other jobs on the side. But I think that most of us, when going into education, are really looking for that gratification and that we want to show love to the students that we're going to have. We have a lot of love to give, and we don't know where to put it. And so we want to educate it, educate, put our love into education. And so it's really having teachers support other teachers, as well as job fairs. Whenever we would have job fairs as little kids. Firefighters would come, lawyers would come, police officers would come, even chefs. But we never saw a teacher, even though there was a teacher right there teaching us every single day. We were never really able to talk about what teachers do, talk about different types of teachers that there is, like special education. And so we're not open to how many different jobs you're able to get that you're still able to teach. It might not just be in like a third grade classroom. It could be a different way of teaching. You could do trade school. You could do, you could show kids how to build a car. So it's very much trying to show more people different ways that you're able to teach as well as telling them what teaching is. Because when we think of teaching, we think of that boring history teacher that we had. We don't necessarily think of that fun teacher that we could have had. So it's really about opening different doors as well as having educators support us as future educators. Okay, so now those are all the questions that we were scripted, but now we're always open to answering other questions. So in the comments, I did see a question and I think this was a little bit more directed towards Justin, but anybody's welcome to answer is why is project based learning not available to all students? And that, yeah, that's the question. Um, it's because of school constraints. Project-based learning is time consuming. Like, it's not like lecturing where you're like, okay, this is how you multiply radicals. Um, here's your homework. Uh, your test is next, next week. That's like time efficient. 
but with project-based learning, you don't know how long that kid's going to take to to realize, like, this is how you multiply radicals. This is how, this is, um, this is how you find that. This is how they find out the moon phases and everything else. It's very, very time consuming. And that's why, um, that's why a lot of schools can't implement it. Um, and on top of that, you still have to do some lecturing in case they find like the answer to the pig question and miss all the small details. Because there, there was an event where I was observing a project based uh, student uh, teacher doing project based learning in a classroom, and one of the students, all they did was look up the answer and like, okay, here's the answer. Why am I doing this? Um, it defeats the whole point. But that's why a project based learning is in, um, implemented in all schools and 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 or all classrooms. Um, I also feel like um, I agree with that, and also like um, there's like a lack of funding as well in schools and so that also affects um, being able to do project-based le uh, learning in schools um, which sucks because in like the richer areas like they have more opportunities and um, and so that also that also kind of sucks and um, because the students who are in like in schools in urban settings like they also deserve to have a lot of opportunities and resources just as much as other students who are in who live in richer areas because um, just because you're a student of color just because you look different just because you ha speak a different language um, doesn't mean that like you shouldn't have the same quality education as other students who are th considered the majority you know um, and so that's also an issue in education And so I remember that for our project, like we sometimes had a project, but it was maybe a week long. So although we did have projects, it wasn't enough to be able to really educate us on what does it take to make an actual project work until I'm pretty sure Victoria experienced it. I'm pretty sure Justin is experiencing it right now, a reflective project, the IB project that we all had to do. And so that was the biggest project I had worked on. And I had very little to skills because we never got taught how to do a project. We never got taught how to write it, how, how we're supposed to interview people. So I remember going into Mr. Gunter's office and being like, what do I do next? Asking so many people around me if I could interview them. And thankfully I was able to interview quite a few. And so it's, but I had no idea how to navigate through that project because I had little to no experience. So now going into the work field, we would have little to no experience when it comes to doing projects as a team or on our own. So project-based learning is not just about maybe learning that subject about the project, it's learning time management. It's learning about how to communicate with other people, how to present your project in an efficient way. And so all these things, not just the subject. So we really do need that project-based learning to get more communication skills, time management, there is so many skills that project-based learning could give us. And uh, we also had another question. It is, how are y'all doing networking? Do you feel supported in your current school? Do you think having a Latinx mentor would be helpful? All these questions are open to being answered, one or all three. Up to you guys. I think I like the idea of a Latino mentor. Um, Mostly because I don't, you know, I don't get a lot of Spanish around me. Like Latinx is, you know, one of the one exceptions. Um, in terms of networking, uh, I think my school provides pretty, pretty good networking because I have, you know, language teachers that actually enjoy what they're doing and actually know what they're doing. A lot of the people there know what they're doing, but obviously a lot of teachers don't, and they're the ones I don't talk to necessarily. Um, but they're very helpful. It's mostly because I go to a magnet school, Sumner Academy. Um, I know a lot of other schools don't get that. Like, a lot of the teachers there are just there because it's a job. Like, um, they just do it because it's a job, and they complain about it all the time. So I'm very fortunate and privileged in that aspect because I know other students don't get that. Although I wish it was that was the case for everyone else. Um, I go to KU, and... Um... This is my second year here, and I feel like, in a way, I am supported um, because so um, I'm so I'm a Casey scholar, and so like we have like our own mentors, 
um, and most of us are like um, Latinx students who are Casey scholars here at KU. And um, I'm also in this program called Hawklink, which is like to connect like students of color um, and other minority students together. And so I feel like I have like really made like a good community here who has supported me and like people in my dorm as well. Like I live in like uh, one of the scholarship dorms, um, which are also for like minority students and students of low income. So I feel like I have found a really nice community here. Um, at first, it was a little bit weird because coming to a predominantly white institution um, <clears throat> because I came from Sumner Academy. So it was a little bit different, you know, being used to um, a lot of diversity and then coming here where there's less diversity. But I feel like nowadays, um, like these new generations, like there's a lot of support, I feel like in most universities, you know, there's clubs, there's there's things that help students of color. And I really think that's amazing. Um, but I know that like in past centuries, that wasn't the case. Um, and so it's always important to like remember those who, um, who like basically like fought for Latinx students' rights on on campus because um, a lot of them felt I alienated and isolated, um, which really sucks. Um, that's what I've been learning also in my, I'm taking a Latin American history course right now and I've been learning a lot from it. Um, and so, yeah. Um, but yeah, I really feel supported here, um, even among um, all the white people, but I still feel supported, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, mm, so when it comes to networking, I think that overall in my high school years, I did really well. I was open to this organization as well as the Learning Club organization, and which those two have helped me so much. I know both Justin and Victoria are part of the Learning Club as well. They have offered us jobs. They've given us awesome internships, awesome connections to people that I know Miss Victoria, a person that is in the Learning Club, still talks to my family. And whenever they have events, they send us cookies, even though they know I'm in college and I'm away, they still make sure like, bring me home one. My mother gets so annoyed. She's like, I have so many cookies for you. And I'm like, I will go eat them. Yes. Yeah, so their connections and they are people that we will be able to see after we graduate college. And when we start our own families, we're still going to remember Miss Victoria or um, we're going to remember all of them. And so when it comes to support at my school, I have support when it comes to my teachers. I am taking a women's study class and I love that teacher. That teacher is very open about all subjects that we wanna talk about. My counselor is pretty good as well. I was actually in a situation where I experienced racism directly and he was like, you're getting out of that situation real quick. And we moved me dorms, we moved me away from that person and everything's been great. So he really does understand the fact that I'm not I don't look like the rest of my students, my rest of my classmates, and he appreciates that. And he's very open to me and having me like come to his office and annoy him every day to make sure that I have the right classes and the right situation. So I do think that a Latinx mentor would be helpful to anybody. Right now, I think I've counted about six Latinos in my college, and that's like in every, like just walking around. So we're not a prominently, we're not very diverse. Um, and so like, for example, for um, National um, Hispanic Heritage Month, we had no events. And it felt kind of discouraging because I am Hispanic and I'm proud of my culture. And so I am a freshman right now, so I couldn't really do much about it, but in the future, I'm gonna make an event. So it's really about getting yourself out there and kind of navigating through college.
I noticed all, we talked a lot about like identity and like how we um it's kind of like we've had to find ourselves in communities uh where we identify with those students I wanted to ask like which what was your uh, um experience growing up did you have a lot of students you could identify with um and like and with your culture and your language because I noticed that um in my experience I lacked that a lot that I just kind of hanged out with whoever you know they didn't have to have to be Hispanic but I think that's why I lost a lot of my Spanish but I wanted to ask about like your experience growing up in the education what was it like for you um you're asking me right <laughs> or, okay <laughs> just making sure um yeah I feel like um growing up like I grew up around a lot of Hispanics um and um a lot of just like I diverse people like I never really had any like uh people like friends who were like white like I only had like one but but they also grew up around like a lot of diversity as well um it wasn't until I came to KU that I feel like I've been meeting more people um and um and like more like like white people um who are like also open-minded um which is also great but there's still a lot of issues here on on KU's campus you know um and so I feel like yeah like <clears throat> like I feel like my friend group has like really changed lately like um I feel like I've met different more different people here at college um and which is really great um so yeah um I and like all my roommates they're all his Hispanic except for one of them but um <clears throat> but yeah like I feel like I'm surrounded by people of my community and a lot of people from other communities as well and hopefully I get to meet more people as well. So yeah. I'm a little jealous now. I always had that sort of environment growing up. Mm -hmm. Sorry, so our homecoming game is today. And so we have a lot of electricity that is like going out, we have like, so you might hear some mules that are very angry outside because we're trying to beat the record and we have a lot of mules outside. So sorry about that. Um, I'm not sure where you guys were at. Can you repeat that last thing? What did you say? Oh, I just came into when one of your questions was being asked. I wasn't sure what you guys were talking about. Oh. Uh, I just asked. Uh, I just asked a general question. I asked, um, like, what was your experience uh, growing up in like the educational world? Like, what was your experience with other people of your identity? I said, like, I didn't grow. I didn't grow up with a lot of like. I had a lot of friends, but they didn't have to be necessarily Hispanic to be my friend. I, I kind of had like a mix, and we didn't. I never. And that. And for that. And for that reason, I didn't talk a lot of Spanish because English was the predominant uh, language for all cultures within my education system. That's what I said. Um, uh, what, what, do you, what was your experience growing up? Yeah, so during elementary, there was a group of maybe six um, different Hispanics. And we were just kind of expected to be friends. And we were friends. So we kind of did that stereotype just because we were like the only ones that we could really talk about when we would go celebrate the Virgin Mary and what we were going to cook for Christmas, if we're going to make tamales. So it was really the only people that I was able to connect with. And then going into Central Middle School, I'm, they talk a lot of bad things about Central Middle School, but Central Middle School really did help me when it comes to um, like feeling more involved in the community just because there's so many people that look like me and have the same experiences. So normally when talking about what we're gonna do for La Virgen de Guadalupe when we were gonna go to church, I would see them. I'd see my classmate like two rows down. I would sit next to them when we were gonna have um, the drink that we drink. I'm not sure what it's called, but yeah. So it's really about. It was a better community. It was low income, but we were happy. And then going into Central Middle into Sumner, again, it was we were low income, but we were happy. We were able to experience different types of cultures. I know that the French club did a lot of different types of events. 
as well as the Hispanic organization, there was a lot of inclusiveness and it felt nice to be part of a community that I wasn't excluded out of. So, yeah. Sorry, sorry, I forgot your name. Was your name Victoria? Okay, I was I was trying to involve you, and I had like a really big like brain fart. I was like, oh, I don't know her name. I don't know how to escape this social trap. And so I went on to her. Um, I'm really like I'm also jealous now of you too because you have this you have had this experience with like Hispanic people. Um, I didn't really get that a lot. Um, I knew of Hispanic people, but like that to me, that wasn't enough to be uh, back then or growing up. That wasn't enough for like I had like a set of requirements to be someone's friend. Like as a little kid, you don't know them, but you just have those requirements. Like, are they funny? Like, are they fun to hang out with? Hispanic wasn't necessarily one of them. I just you know wanted friends as a kid, and the friends I made weren't like um, weren't all Hispanics. We're all different. Uh, we are all from different cultures, but it doesn't mean they we got to experience those cultures. Um, I think I did. I think I do notice um, is that in school we don't we don't spend a lot of time to celebrate our own cultures, like on holidays. Um, instead of like, and uh, in, in, in the educational world, instead of trying to celebrate those like holidays, we just don't have school days, and um, it's just kind of the assumption is made that um, our families are going to spend those days. Uh, celebrating those holidays and my parents didn't do that a lot um i just kind of knew that i just knew the day of the holiday and that's it like labor day or halloween where we didn't celebrate it a lot um uh but when it came to my own culture holidays uh we did we did celebrate those but since it was just my family and not everyone else i got like a, a small amount of my culture when it came to those holidays and not a lot i wish i could have gotten more but it's because it's just my mom and my dad that were celebrating it. I didn't have like really close friends that are Hispanic. Um, I just had cousins I, I see like twice a year compared to my friends I see every day. So we did have a question from one of our old teachers, Madame Rabinette, a very good support role model for I think all three of us, because I think all three of us had her. Um, and so um, her question was, did one of us celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month at your school? And if not, I'm adding this part, and if not, how would you celebrate it? Um, OK, I'll start. Um, so here at KU, um, honestly, I don't feel like I really like saw m many events, to be honest. Like. I'm pretty sure we have like, uh, like a Halo group, like a Latino organization group here. But I don't know. I didn't really see any much like publicized events. But here at my scholarship dorm, um, our so like in the scholarship dorms we have like leadership positions, and and I'm currently the vice president here, and um, and we have our social chair, and like he like has actually like been like, um, incorporating the culture, um in like this month um mainly because also he's hispanic too but um like uh, once a, so like once a week we have like um this thing called like a specialty cook so like in the scholarship dorms we don't have like a meal plan we like all cook or whatever and so like anyways like once a week we would have some sort of like hispanic um dish like he's been making like pozole lately or like and sometimes he'll make arroz con leche, um, things like that. And so I think that's been a really great way because um, being here in college, sometimes you get homesick, especially when it comes to the food, at least for me. Like I miss my mother's home cooked meals, you know. I miss um, eating Mexican food. Um, and so that's been really nice, um, you know, um, having like people who like actually like care and like have been like <clears throat> cooking things for us. So that really makes me feel at home and like in tune back with my culture 
Um, and then also, like, what's upcoming is the Dia de los Muertos, Day of the Dead. Um, so our social chair is also going to do something like that. We're going to, like, make, a, like, an altar, like, una ofrenda. So we, we can put, like, um, you know, pictures of our dead loved ones and things like that. So in a way, yes, I have been celebrating it a little bit. Um, but I have been also busy with homework and things like that. Um, so I think that in a way like I would celebrate it like that you know like with food of my culture and like you know friends um my friends who are Hispanic you know um just celebrating together and eating I feel like food is really a big part of our culture and so that's a really great way to like get people together and um to communicate and to just you know have a good time so yeah I'm gonna have to agree on the food like, the food is a really, really big part. Uh, my mom made some sopa de pollo, pozole. Um, my dad used to make these things called chanclas. It was like a bread with um, um, carne in it. It was really good. Like, it's really good. I'm going to miss it growing up. But um, in terms of celebrating, like, Hispanic Heritage Month, um, I think I should start off with I'm lazy. And a lot of the opportunities, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of the things that happen at school, are there for Hispanic Heritage Month. Her- Hispanic Heritage Month, if you get involved, we have an LSU club. Um, but because I'm lazy, I don't go to their meetings. Um, also school and everything, you know, that that also makes me more lazy because I had to do that too. And I'm a senior, yada, yada, you know, I'm just lazy. But it's definitely there. It's definitely there. If you get involved, you'll feel in tune with your culture. you feel more close to your culture. Um, uh yeah, and Dia de los Muertos too are com- is coming up. I'm kind of getting excited for that now that I think about it because now I want to celebrate it because I, I really ever celebrated it. I, re- I never really knew what to do for Dia de los Muertos, but I think I'll just ask my mom what, what I can do to celebrate Dia de los Muertos. But I do want to say, like, it's there. It's definitely there. And at Sumner Academy, it's definitely there. Just, just get involved. Don't be lazy, and you'll feel, you know, closer to your culture if you do that. So one thing, one tip I could give you, uh, Justin, when coming to college, bring your spices, bring your salt, your pepper, your chili pepper, just because there doesn't seem to be a lot of that around here. But there is some good food. There is some. But for me, there was no talk of national heritage, Hispanic month. There was no talk of it. And so we had no events. We maybe had a Taco Tuesday, but... It was not the right taco- tacos, um, not even a warm tortilla, nothing like that. Yeah, so I'm not, and I'm not completely sure if that was meant to be just a Taco Tuesday, just because it's Tuesday and it's tacos, um, or if it was for a National um, Hispanic Month. And so uh, there is no real talk about th- events like that in my college. And for when it comes to my family, we don't necessarily celebrate. Dia de los Muertos, just because we thankfully haven't had any family members that have passed away. So I still have my grandparents and my aunts and my cousins. So, and when they do pass away, we will definitely celebrate them on that day. But they're really, we have respect for the culture. And if somebody invites us to a dinner for it, we'll go. But we don't have enough friends just because we don't have nobody on the other side so yeah um but other than that we do do a lot for um the dia de la guadalupe so we are very big believers of the virgen guadalupe um and so we always go for her birthday on december 12th we sing the happy birthday we have her image we decorate her image we well when we were younger we would dress up as um, the people that would go see her. So we are very big on that one though. Um, another question we did have is how would you change funding at the school level and at university level? That's a big question. Um, uh, I think at like this like primary and secondary level of education. Um I think funding 
it's a, it's a hard question. I'm not sure if I can answer it, but uh, I mean, the simple answer is like, you know, pay the teachers more, but like that, where does that money come from? Like it's from the government, is that going to have to come from us, the taxpayers? Um, I think, I think, I think it's, I think a solution I want to provide is like in the States, like specific States have like all the taxpayers, like take all the, all the money, all the PAC series you're taking and divide it evenly among all the schools. Because in some, in Kansas, there's a thing called the white flight. Um, people of uh, a certain color, like white people, they all move away from uh, areas that are that are starting to become more colored, and they're moving away. And so we have like this divide um, of like this area is mostly you know people of color, people like us. Well, this area is mostly white people. And what we're seeing is that those white people, since they're better off and privileged, um, and they get paid more on average. Uh, they pay their taxes more. They pay more taxes. And those schools look better. And they look like they have more money. In terms of here, where a lot of our schools don't look like that. They look, you know, poorer. And that's because our community is poor. And I think that's, I think it's kind of unfair. Because, um, like, um, we're, at, we're at a disadvantage because we're just colored. Just because of that. And that's not fair to us. Because we just, we're just born like this. Um, so that's, I think that's one solution to the whole funding thing, um, funding issue that we have is just take all the taxpayer money and divide it evenly along all the schools in our state because um, it's not fair currently. In terms of college, um, uh, I'm also not sure. Um, I think... I think we pay too much money to go to college, uh, way too much money to go to college. Student debt is a real thing. I think if there's a way to tone that down, that would be helpful. Um, of course, we already have that. We already have uh, workarounds like scholarships, um, Pell Grants, FAFSA. But I, I still think it's like a little insane that we had to pay like $22,000 for classes uh, each year. Um, the sort of money, that's the sort of money we don't have. Um, and that's not to mention the fact that a lot of us are getting degrees. And so the value of a degree is starting to decrease because just so many of us are getting degrees. So it's starting to become less valuable. Um, yeah, I, I um, agree with a lot of that. And also like um, here at like the university, like, yeah, like it's a lot that we pay and kind of weird especially like last year when it was my first year many I know a lot of students were not living on campus because they didn't really like see like the point of living on campus and like um you know with COVID and not like most of our classes were all online and so it kind of sucks having to pay the same amount for like as if it were an in-person class um but it was all through zoom and sometimes like the quality of that was not like up to the standards as it is like having an in-person class um, and also, like, students who were not even living on campus had to still pay, like, infrastructure fees and, like, on-campus fees, even though they weren't living on campus. So it just goes to show how universities really like to, um, you know, take out money, get money from students. Um, this year, I brought my car, and the parking permit was, like, over $300, and there's less parking spots than there are parking tickets to sell. So... Yeah, universities have a lot of money, so do like a lot of wealthy people, a lot of wealthy white people, they have a lot of money, so I feel like there needs to be a way to like shift around that. Um, obviously we need to tax, we need to tax more people who are like CEOs and elite people and like, uh, like the higher elites, the billionaires, you know, like they need to be taxed more and like that money some of that money used to be used for edu for the education system especially for elementary schools um k through 12 schools basically because they are the ones who need the most funding a lot of funding has been taken away from like um like the arts programs which are very necessary because um believe it or not you know the arts help the students in in their other classes as well in the core classes so um yeah money needs to be shifted around and um and taken away from all the billionaires like you know and so and so yeah um um schools deserve uh, more funding um and um so yeah and also teachers need to be paid more as well 
um, I would say. Um, so yeah. I think that a way that we could like shift around some money actually would be about scouting different talents. So I know at Sumner Academy, we have a really big art program in which each year we receive a big check. And that's because most of us are really passionate when it comes to art. And so we have a lot of different artists, a lot of good artists. And one of the main reasons we have so many artists is because it's part of the IB art class. So you have to really be good at what you, what you do. And so I know that I think it was last year or two years ago that Schlegel had to give up their glass machine so and that glass machine it melts down the glass and so we received it because they couldn't afford to teach students how to work with glass they couldn't afford to keep the machines anymore and so because we are a big art school we received it so now although it's appreciated we have a lot of benefits we have two glass welding machines we have a lot of glass so much glass in those storage rooms in which most of them I believe I was one of the only students to work with glass that year. And so we are using, we are sitting on a big pile of money right there because we have many things that we don't necessarily need anymore. And we just keep on piling them back in the storage room. So it's really having to declutter our actual storage rooms and seeing what we can sell and then use that money for, I know that the band also, needs new uniforms sometimes, just because sometimes they don't fit correctly. Sometimes we have a really tall student or a really short student and we need a uniform that will fit them. And so maybe like shifting around and seeing what we have extras would like really be helpful, at least at our school. And then we could always do different types of fundraisers for our districts. I know that in Central Middle School, they do a fundraiser in which they sell a lot of Hispanic food they sell tamales, they sell corn in the cup. And so that brings in a lot of money. And then they're able to use it into their schools. So it's really trying to find a fundraiser that's tailored to your community. Just because I know if Central Middle School did a car wash, they wouldn't attend as much just because, well, my kid could wash the car. But not we don't always make tamales year round. And so that's something that our community does want. And then when it comes to colleges, that's a tricky question, just because I know that some colleges are cheaper than others. And sometimes the paycheck of the professors just seems pretty big, considering the fact that they don't put in a lot of their materials, such as middle school and high school students, high school teachers that have to supply their own paper, their own um materials while professors just kind of say buy this book so you kind of have to buy your own materials for that class and half the time you don't use that book so make sure that it says required then buy the book and so that's just a whole lot of money that you could also save but the professors ask for the book and don't use it so yeah it's a lot of little things that we could do to save up money And I believe that is all the questions for today. If anybody has any more questions, if not, I am truly blessed to be here with Victoria and with Justin. It was great having this conversation with you guys, as well as everybody who commented. Thank you for being here for us. Yes, this was, this was a great experience. Thanks for having me.